So here we are on the second and final day of the 24th EBRD annual meeting in Tbilisi, Georgia. I'm here again, of course, with Ben Aris, BNE IntelliNews' editor-in-chief. Ben, today dominated pretty much by Ukraine. Yeah, I think Ukraine is actually overshadowing all the events here. Uh, they had a country session, the Phoenix arising, and Natalie Jureska, the finance minister, was saying that the Phoenix has already started to rise, in so much as they've been putting together a really quite impressive uh, raft of reforms and really the hard work of rebuilding the Ukrainian economy, doing the work that's been ignored for 20 years, has begun. Uh, the new corruption agency uh, got a new head just yesterday. Um, there's going to be a new uh, head for the State Property Committee, which will clear the way for privatizations to begin. That's going to happen in the next two weeks. And the economy is more or less stabilized. You know, we heard from the economics minister that um, they got rid of the scams on, on oil and so they've begun the process of de oligarching uh, the, uh, the whole economy. De oligarching, there's yes, a good, there's a good that's verb. A good word. Uh, but this is the problem is, is that the, the main issue, which is the issue of uh, what they're going to do with this haircut of their debts. So uh, these debt negotiations are now really going sour, and Juresco, I guess she's trying to do a bit of a well, they repair were job. Flinging barbs at each other. I mean, the finance minister accusing the the credit committee of like non-standard practices and like um, negotiating through the media, uh, and it's going to be really tough because the the, the private holders of debt uh, are entitled to refuse the deal. And also the, the Russians in particular have said that we're not going to renegotiate our $3 billion debt. Mm. And that's a serious issue because uh, if Ukraine defaults on that debt and it's deemed to be a sovereign debt, which it seems to be, then under the IMF's own rules, it will not be allowed to lend any more money to, you, uh, to Ukraine. So this is a potentially extremely nasty situation and nobody's um, giving any ground. And, and I was actually disappointed that this didn't come up in the Ukrainian session at all. I mean, the whole thing was skirted around uh, because to me it's the main issue. But I mean, it, it affected uh, you. I mean, the EBRT chairman, Sesuma, ended up having to respond to yeah, the Russian Yeah, I went, I went to see uh, um, Sesuma Chakrabarty uh, this morning and uh, Russian Deputy, Fine Minister, Deputy Finance Minister Storchak has been saying that the reason the EBRD uh, has uh, frozen new projects in Russia mm. while maintaining its existing uh, portfolio of projects in Russia and its seven offices in Russia and so on uh, is because it's being politicized by mm. governments in Washington, London and elsewhere. Uh, and so Summer didn't really deny that uh, in the press conference. He said, you know, the geopolitics obviously affect us, uh, but since we received that guidance from our board not to um, generate new projects in Russia last July mm -hmm. uh, we've continued to maintain contacts with our he called them partners and friends in Russia mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously the EBRD has got a multi billion dollar portfolio in Russia it's the biggest and, single and investor it, in it's the easily country. the single biggest investor the other interesting thing that came out he countered Storchak or at least aids to uh, the Russian finance ministry who said one reason the EBRD made such a loss last year was because it had curtailed its uh, activities in Russia. Right. That's not actually right, uh, Sosuma said. They haven't curtailed them because they still have a big portfolio. But the reason they did make a loss last year was because they lost on the Russian currency. They have a big portfolio yeah. and valuations are often different. Uh, conversely, the EBRD for the first four months of this year, calendar year, has done very well. And again, he, he said that's largely because the currency has recovered and it's unwinding the paper losses yeah. of last year. But it seems to me that Sassum has played a pretty straight bat on this. He yeah. says, yes, these are geopolitical issues uh, and they're beyond our pay grade. Well, to be fair to him, uh, the EBRD itself didn't make this decision. I mean, they're beholden to their shareholders and they have enough Western European countries as shareholders who made that call. And so it's out of his hands. I mean, they can't do it. But I mean, it, the EBRD's own results make the point that the Russia-Ukraine conflict is overshadowing the entire region. Absolutely. Because we saw in the, in the macro forecast that the quantitative evening in Europe is actually going to bolster uh, Southeast and Central Europe's uh, economic uh, chances this year. But everywhere in the East uh, is being pulled down by the Russian recession and the collapse of the Ukrainian economy. The Ukrainian forecast minus 7.5% yeah. uh, well, That was a significant uh, downgrade. Contraction of the economy. At the start uh, of this year we were talking about minus 3% that's right. and minus 7 is going to be even worse than last that's, that's year. Right. But again, if you talk to the Ukrainian delegation, they're saying that these bad numbers, we're going to be looking at them in the rearview mirror.
uh, for the rest of this year. That this is the low point and they start to grow from here. The other little bit of interesting bit of geopolitics I heard today I wanted to tell you about was a session with Thane Gustafsson, of course, ah. a very well-known writer on particularly Russia, energy markets, has teamed up on several projects with Daniel Jurgen, of course, who wrote The Prize, that massive, brilliant uh, Pulitzer-winning tome on the global oil industry. And Thane Gustafsson really didn't mince his words in a session I just came from. He said, when it comes to sanctions on Russia, the US wanted to impose very focused sanctions, but they ended up, quotes, dropping a nuclear bomb on the Russian economy. Yeah. Uh, he also said... Well, in the form of the financial in, sanctions. In the form of the financial sanctions, uh, he, he, he linked uh, the imposition of sanctions to the collapse of the ruble, which, of course, affected the Russian population, yeah. uh, many of them losing money on their savings. He also said we should all look out for, at the end of June, the renewal of EU sanctions. Of course, that has to be a unanimous renewal. Yeah. And he said Germany will be the swing vote in that, given the links between German industrialists and Russia, they'll put pressure on Merkel. And he also said that even if the EU doesn't vote to renew sanctions, and uh, he seemed to intimate that, uh, that they wouldn't, because that does have to be unanimous, he said you'll still have many European companies with big operations in America who will continue to be very fearful yeah. of extending their operations in Russia because of the long arm of, of US compliance. Indeed. Well, this is what, I mean, corp, uh, the, the people who do the, the corporate governance uh, and uh, compliance, rather, in all these companies, most of them won't touch Russia with a barge pole, even if their company or business is not on the sanctions list. And it's because of partly what happened to BNP Paribas, that That's they, right. got, they got fined $9 billion. For encourager les autres. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone looked at that and thought, that's unfair. They didn't actually do anything illegal, and yet they got fined and were deemed to be in, uh, in contradictions of sanctions. And it's made Russia toxic for, uh, you know, and the Russians are desperately trying to get out of this by, you know, this pivot to the east. But um, we'll see. I, I actually personally think the sanctions in Europe at least, will, will fall to pieces uh, by the end of the year. Just because there's too many countries like Hungary, like Serbia, Bulgaria. Italy. Yeah, who are not, uh, Spain, yeah. who, who are actually not interested in continuing it because they're, they're looking to their business and their economies are not doing well at all. Well, that's it from us uh, on the final day of the EBRD Summit in Tbilisi, uh, Georgia. It's been a fascinating couple of days. Plenty more on the website, www.bne.eu. From myself, Liam Halligan and Ben Harris, well thanks for watching.